Levels and curves can be the most intimidating tools when it comes to learning to edit photos, but today we're going to make them super simple and easy to understand. Welcome back to episode seven of the Photomator Masterclass, where we've been teaching you all of the tools you need to get the absolute most out of your photos using Photomator on your Mac. Today, there's only one project file if you'd like to follow along, even though you don't have to. It's from signatureedits.com, and so you can go check them out to get lots of free raw images to practice your edits on. So once you have those downloaded, make sure you like and subscribe to make sure you see the next episodes when they become available, and support me on YouTube or Patreon if you'd like early access to all of my future episodes. Okay, let's jump right in. All right, now like I promised, these tools are way easier to understand than people seem to think. You just really need a gradient set up so that you can see what the different sliders are doing to your image. So we're gonna start here with levels, and that's because levels and curves are basically the same tool. Curves just has a couple more options, and so it's easier to explain it in terms of levels first. So for now, if you don't already have it on RGB mode, make sure you do, because that's what we're gonna work with. You can see down here we have a few sliders, the ones that matter the most are this endpoint here, this middle point here, and this endpoint here. Now, you don't know it, but you actually already understand what this endpoint does. This is your black point slider. If you remember from our previous lesson, sliding up the black point moves the point in the image that turns to black. And you can drag it the opposite direction as well to make it so that it never actually gets to black. Now with the levels tool, you can't drag it into the negative, but what you can do is slide it over, and this is the same as black point, and you have access to the entire graph. So you can see I can make the black point as high up on my image as I want. Now as I'm sliding this around, you'll see there's these little angular lines. This is showing you that this middle gray right here is now turned to black. And if you look at our gradient, that matches, right? Middle gray has now turned to black. So that explains the leftmost slider. You probably can guess the rightmost slider. This is your white point. So I can drag it the opposite direction and I can choose how much of my image is consumed into white. And it's the same thing if I put it here in the middle, you can see middle gray has turned into white and everything above it. Now, the thing that makes levels powerful is actually this middle slider. So I can take middle gray, and I can actually choose which values become middle gray. And the reason why this is powerful is because I can make a much more contrasty image by sliding this middle slider around, and I have more control over where that contrast lives in the tonal range of my image. So once you've done that, you understand this tool pretty well. These two extra sliders just let you change the gradient between these points. So if it's right in the middle of two points, then it's a nice, smooth, even flow between them. If you drag it to one side or the other, then it makes it more of a curve going into the other side. So it's not that smooth, even transition. And messing with these can be really interesting ways to also introduce some local contrast as well. You might be wondering then, why do I have all of these extra modes? And it's pretty simple. Luminance is basically the same thing as RGB, but instead of editing all of the color values of the pixels, it's attempting just to take our perceived brightness of those pixels and shift it according to that, keeping the colors intact. And so for a lot of images, if I've already got the colors dialed in and I'm just trying to add a little contrast, I will switch to luminance so that my color values stay put. But the tool is exactly the same. The red, green, and blue sections are ones that you're basically never going to use. And the reason why you're never going to use them is because these three eyedroppers are just an easier way of doing the same thing. So if I take a real image, one thing that can often happen is that your image will shift in the highlights and the shadows in a way that maybe the highlights are more red and the shadows are more blue or whatever. The color shift doesn't matter, but often the highlights and the shadows will be shifted in directions that are different from each other. And so what this allows us to do is tell it which part is a highlight, which part is a shadow, and which part is a middle gray, which we don't have. And it attempts to then do the appropriate corrections on the red, green, and blue channels. And you can see just by clicking, it has more or less matched these values to the histogram. But with one interesting caveat, this is like a really warm picture. And so the reds 
histogram looks way more full than like the blue, for example. But the point is still the same. It did all of the sliders for us and we didn't have to try to guess at what the right balance was. And then later, if we want to introduce some contrast, we can come in here with just luminance directly and we can introduce some contrast while leaving the red, green, blue corrections alone. Now, the last thing that you'll want to know under this try dot is you have auto color and you have auto contrast. And I'll be honest, I don't know how to get them to work well. I've tried in a few different scenarios and they usually don't work right unless it's already a decently well-balanced image. So I would recommend that you start here, you use the RGB to get your contrast. And then if you don't like the results or if you already got like a good color going on and you wanna leave the colors alone, then use luminance instead of RGB. Okay, let's scroll down now to curves. So curves is actually the same tool. I know it doesn't look like it, but if you come into this drop down, it's the same options. You'll see it has the same three pickers and it has the same two options in this try dot menu. It's the same tool, it just has more options. So if we come back here to the gradient, you can see I have this bottom point and I have this top point. I just don't have any of the middle points, but I can get the same results by moving the top and bottom. So if I slide this, you can see this is just my black point. You can also see that this is just my white point, but you can also see that I can introduce fade. If you remember the fade slider, this is basically the same as moving your black point in the negative direction. And you can also see I've got my fade for my white, so it never gets to white. So I've already got two options that the levels tool didn't have that I can do with curves. Now you might be wondering, but hey, wasn't there middle slider? And the answer is yes. And the reason why this tool is powerful is because you can introduce as many of those sliders as you want. So if I just click, I can set this middle point and I can slide it side to side and I actually get the exact same result as that middle slider, which now you might be saying, well, hey, wait a second, what about those other points? And you can see I've got these horizontal lines here. If I go ahead and add a point there and add a point here, these are the same as those other sliders. So I can slide this around and I can slide this around. And what happens is you end up being able to shape the tone of your image in a way that is much more controlled and even more localized, so I can like, so for example, I can move this all the way up here if I want it really bright, but just right at the end of my range there, in a way that you can't control with the levels. Now, there's a couple things that I wanna make sure that you are aware of with this tool. The first is that if you see your line ever smushing against the bottom or the side, or the top, that means that you are getting crushed colors. And a lot of times crushed blacks or crushed whites are actually stylistically totally fine. In fact, if you watch most movies, most movies have very crushed blacks. So don't feel bad about doing it. Just be aware that when you're doing that, everything that's hitting this bottom line is pure black. There's no color left and same on the opposite direction. The other is if you wanna get rid of a point, you just drag it off of your graph. And then the third, is that most of the time, instead of having three points in the middle, you'll just wanna use two because you can imply the position of this middle point by just moving these two around. And you can see if I get these lined up like this, then middle gray has been left effectively alone and I've just rearranged the contrast for the black and the white end of my image. I wanted to show you a couple of adjustments that are really common that people do using the curves. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm just gonna increase the exposure a little bit to make this image just a little bit more visually pleasing right out the gate. So far and away, the most common thing to do is use this to introduce contrast. And the reason why you're going to use this over the contrast slider is because the contrast slider is going to squish the middle of your histogram. And you can see in this image, our histogram is not in the middle, like the middle of my distributed brightness values is actually over here. And so if I did contrast the way the contrast slider would, it's effectively doing this, which is okay, but you can see the center of this is not actually that centered. So if I wanted, I could actually move this point way over here, and I could move this point way over here, 
and I could change the area of my image that I'm getting contrast in. And so I have way more control than I would just using the contrast slider alone. Now the other thing that is super common, sometimes you will have raw images or like a screenshot from log footage that needs you just to do a bow curve one direction or the other. That is super common. In this particular image, I honestly think you could even do something like this and that works pretty well. It's a totally different mood than the original image, but it actually has a decent brightness to it. And then the last thing is after you have your contrast set up the way that you want, you can grab these points and say, okay, well, I'm gonna introduce a fade. And you can see how that immediately makes it look just a little bit more retro by not letting it get all the way to black. And even after I've done that now, maybe I say, hey, actually, with that little bit of a retro look, I actually want a more contrasty curve. And so I'm gonna use this S curve, is what they call it. And I'm gonna introduce a little bit of fade on the high end so the whites don't get all the way to white. And that actually looks pretty good and pretty retro as is. Like I said, I think these tools are pretty simple and easy to understand once you've actually seen them demoed in this, in this way. But if you still have questions, let me know in the comments below. And I will also make sure to link to another video where I play with these tools a little bit more and explain it in a little bit of a different way. And if this video didn't click for you, maybe that one will help clarify some of your questions as well. All right, that is it for this episode. I hope you found that helpful. If you did, make sure you support me here on YouTube or on Patreon. That way you can get early access to all my videos as they come out. And if you'd like to see something new, maybe check out the new channel. I'm trying to get started with my little brother. He's working at a small place called Walt Disney Animation Studios. And so we're talking a lot about film and animation and even making some of our own animations. Okay, we'll catch you on the next video.